Welcome back. This is Poetry in Motion. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and joining shortly will be the wonderful, best-selling international author, Sonny Singh. But before we get into the show, I want to remind you, if you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, please reach out and say hi. And just a reminder that you can connect to us on all socials, including YouTube, which we'd love to have you live um, listening on YouTube each and every week to the shows that we put out. Replays of all these shows are available on Binge Networks USA, HeroGo TV, Zondra TV Networks, and the Tony TV channel app available on all Roku, LG, and Samsung smart TVs and phones across the planet. Each week, we do an important acknowledgement of the special and important role Indigenous communities play in the development of this country's cultural identity. So I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and broadcast and pay my respects to elders past and present and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening here today. Now, this is the last in our show series of Poetry in Motion with Sony Singh. And it has been an absolute delight to do this series with Sony and get to know lots and lots more about her and her writing and her gift of poetry, which she channels for the world to read. Now, Sony is a cross-cultural seeker of deep knowing. She writes stories of self-discovery to encourage people to accept themselves for who they are and live life on their own terms. Her tales of a character's definitive moments on their life journeys are both mystical and spiritual, and this is an integral part of her storytelling. Sony is of Indian descent, born in Mexico, raised in Colombia, residing in the US and travelling in Australia right now at this moment. When she's not writing, journaling, reading, traveling, she indulges in meditation, yoga, and aromatherapy. She is an international best-selling author of the book called Lonely Dove. And also she has an amazing poetry series called Embody, Embrace, and Embolden. And today we get to talk about the last in her poetry, poetry series, rather, the poetry book called Embolden. I would love you to jump onto Sony's website, sonysing.com, and check out all of her works, her blogs, and all the information on how to connect with Sony and where you can buy all of her amazing books. Sony, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that we are able to stay connected because there's a downpour out here and I keep on getting unstable internet. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Things don't so work out Sony well. in Melbourne and she's got a ferocious storm in the background. So if we lose Sony, we will get her back perhaps minus her video, but we're going to go ahead um, and go, get on with the show and hope that the storm doesn't impact Sony's internet. Now, <laughs> as this is the last in our show, show series, I want to remind the audience again that Sony is now a best-selling Amazon author for Lonely Dove, and that's a phenomenal accomplishment for it is. any I feel author. So blessed, <laughs> and and it should be celebrated because there's many, many, many books out there. But to get to Amazon bestseller in the US is a major milestone for our amazing author Sony. And I know that's that awesome. there's only good things. Oh, there we are, back again. <laughs> we can still hear you. So okay. even if your screen freezes, we can still hear you. Oh, okay, good, good. So yep. I'll just continue talking. Just, yep, <laughs> just continue talking. We'll worry about the screen later. <laughs> now, Sony, um, the next and third um, book in the series is a book 
called Embolden and it's beautiful. Yep. The, the colours of Embolden, I think it's my favourite because blue is my favourite, but it's beautiful. Um, yes. And Embolden, um, and we're talking about it on the eve of its release as a paperback. So mm-hmm. currently you can buy these beautiful poetry books. The whole series are in hardcover and today Embolden releases as a paperback which means that it's accessible for anyone to know, read and love and purchase these books. Sonia, can you hold it up again? It's just a lovely book. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, it It blends in (laughs) with the background. (laughs) It does. It's the same tone of blue as the black screen. I know, I know. (laughs) So Embolden, um, the poetry book, is where this channeling of poetry actually comes becomes very real for you, doesn't it? It is because, um, you know, the best way for me to describe it is Embody being the first book was mm. uh, a bit of a surprise in that I had not expected to be a poet. I had not expected to write poetry. Uh, it sort of just came to me in a, in a in a lot of ways, Embody, uh, I had to sort of come to terms with what was happening, um, that I was kind of feeling the, po- the, the poems come through. Embrace yeah. was, uh, which is the second, second book, uh, Embrace was a little bit more um, kind of flowing. Now I was, yes. you know, realizing or recognizing mm. uh, I am a poet. And for Embolden, I had embraced it. I mean, I accepted yeah. it. I said, okay, yes, I'm a poet. Uh, I know that this is something that I'm going to pursue more and that I am going to be able to uh, kind of bring into my writing um, mm. in, in a conscious way. Uh, yes. But still, uh, it is hard for me uh, to write a poem and just sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a poem. Uh, it's still happens, channeled, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, what happens with and what happened mostly with Embolden is just recognizing, okay, I have, you know, a spark of creativity at this moment. I'm going to honor it and mm. go with it and write the poetry down, uh, b- but just let it flow and, and accept that that's how how it's going to be. Like, And, and for instance, days or even weeks without writing a poem, uh, but once I get hit with a creativity or like that yeah. spark to write, then I write. Like, And it happened to me last night. I hadn't been writing for a few days. And then last night I wrote something like 10 poems just in one go. Um, oh, but it's almost like amazing. once I open myself up to like, oh, poetry's coming. It just <laughs> really flows. So it is, it. Sonia, it is actually about recognizing that creative spark in that moment and giving it the time and energy to let it flow. Because if you didn't stop in that moment, the poems would still come, but they wouldn't come right that moment, would they? So it, it for right. you, it was learning that you have to stop and write. Right. And that's why a lot of times, uh, one, I will travel with a notebook. Uh, mm. And if I don't have a notebook, I'll look for pieces of paper where I can write things down. Yeah. Uh, because that's just honoring that a poem came to me at that moment. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, there are times that, you know, I'm driving and a poem comes to me or I'm in the shower and I'm like, I can't write a poem in that time. Uh, But at least I'll I'll let sort of that little seed stay in Mm -hmm. there. And then the moment I have a chance and I'll, I'll write it down. Uh, But, but the opposite isn't true. You know, if somebody says to me, you know, write a poem, poem. I can't just write a poem. (laughs) Yeah. It's just to get myself in the right kind of space to be able to do that. That's a beautiful creative process to share with the world so that others that are listening, they might have creative moments, but they don't give it the space and the air to breathe. And that's part of what you've been telling us the whole way through this series is you actually have to be aware, recognize, and then honor that gift. Because if you don't, there would be no, none of your beautiful poetry would ever come to life, would it? Yeah. And, you know, when I had um, written Embody and Embrace, we were still going through a lot of the COVID lockdowns, Uh, you know, so I had a lot of time at home. So if something would come, uh, it was easier for me to honor it Uh, with Embolden. 
uh, and, and definitely with the poetry that I've continued writing since, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out and about, I'm doing things, I'm sort of back mm. to living life. And so if a moment comes, the way that I honor it is I write it down wherever I can. So there are yeah. poems that I've written on brochures, that I've written on ticket stubs, that I've oh. uh, written on... <laughs> you know, coasters, just because that's what I have around me. Uh, and, and that helps me kind of capture that that inspiration yeah. in that moment. Amazing, amazing. Um, so each of the series of um, poetry books have actually had um, a sort of a theme and it's no different with Embolden, isn't it? So Embolden is more about the signs and the symbols and the, your communication with the universe. Do you want to talk us through that, Sony? Yeah, so the thing with the, the process of the three books, their, their uh, titles reflect uh, even my journey at the time, but mm. also my journey with poetry in mm. that Embody was very much uh, what uh, was happening internally with me. Uh, mm. what what I was experiencing and a lot of that came out through different physicalities even emotions in my yes this no. is happening and yeah. I'm going to accept it um mm. I I know that I'm in a situation of flux because things don't necessarily last forever yeah uh and emboldened was now saying okay well now that it's become a part of who I yeah. am a part of me uh, how am I going to move forward with this? And with Embolden, a lot of the poetry in it, uh, it has a lot of symbolism. Uh, in I was looking at nature and signs and objects, and uh, in, a, in a very odd way, sometimes I felt like they were talking to me, yeah. even, even though they weren't. Yeah. But it was like they were a source of of inspiration, and so it was. Embolden is 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 more about okay now that we've experienced all this how is that going to now help me moving forward yeah. but how is it going to all help us moving forward mm -hmm. and in you know noticing or, or not even noticing just accepting that we're connected to everything mm -hmm. uh, and that if we allow ourselves to see those connections then we realize that everything that happens around us whether it feels that way or not is in support of us I mean sometimes mm -hmm. they can be negative experiences yeah. or even positive experiences but they're all supportive uh, to our journey. So that's what Embolden is about and all of the poetry yeah, in there is about yeah. that. Sonia, can you tell us some of the things, some of the signs and symbols that were present for you when you were at this time? Can you talk us through some of those stories? Yeah, so I, I looked at all uh, at numbers. Uh, yeah. I, I, I like numerology, mm. uh, and we talked about when in Lonely Dove, there like in the novel, yeah. I've I've incorporated it, yes. but it also became very apparent here uh, with this book. There's there's poems on on dates, uh, yeah. palindrome, which are you know when 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 a date or in fact even a word can be read the same way. Backwards, backwards and forwards yeah yeah uh because that the palindromes in general have a, a special significance like whenever we have a date that is a palindrome mm -hmm. uh usually there are opportunities for us to uh overcome or transcend mm -hmm. certain emotions or certain yeah. things events that are happening in our life and so we start paying attention to that yes uh which I did for this book, then you realize that, you know, emotionally or even physically, um, you go through experiences that are sort of connected to uh, mm. the, the larger workings of, of the universe. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of that. I also started connecting with, um, maybe you can say certain figures or deities. Uh, yes, and I realized yes. that they would just come up, you know, I'd either see them in documentaries or see them in pictures or people put mm -hmm. up a post and so mm -hmm. when I started noticing that then you know a poem would come and I'd I would write about it uh so that, yeah there's a, there's a lot of things um yeah. even nature changing seasons yeah uh, I was gonna ask know, if as, there were any you know, as we go through through winter and things are sort of hibernating that us also kind of being a little bit more inward bound and then spring yes. allowing things to flourish so I do I do uh cover the changing of the seasons, yeah. uh, they tend to 
speak to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in talking about um, animals and nature, flowers and, and, and animals, are any are there any significant stories around those? I know uh, talking to lots of other people, um, people have certain significance around animals. So for me, it's goats and owls. For my sister, it's cockatoos. For other people, <laughs> it's blue butterflies. Um, are there any of those sorts of symbols that relate to you specifically, Sony? Yeah, so for me, it's tigers. Uh, uh -huh. I have a I have a big affinity with with tigers. Uh -huh. uh, I ha I have been told that my my uh, sort of earthly guide is a is a is a tiger, uh, and so oh, wow. you know, I've always felt a very strong connection. Uh, and mm. in fact, there's poems in the book about tigers. Uh, mm. There is for sure even an embody. I think I put one one in there. Yeah. Because that is that affinity with tigers. And I'm going to keep talking because we might have lost Sony and hopefully she won't be lost for too long. And here she is back again. Oh, sorry. It just it's cut me it's off okay. Yeah, it's it's all Sorry, good. The storm has gotten particularly bad right now. So. <laughs> no. And we're talking about tigers, and for you know, tigers can be ferocious. So there's a bit of an analogy there. Um, <laughs> what is it about the tiger, Sony? What is it? Tell me, tell me about that connection to the tiger. You know, I, I'm not sure that I I know exactly what it's about, other than yeah. any time that I am feeling. Uh, a little lost or a little down, yes. I will see tigers. And it's not, <gasps> I don't see them physically because I don't no, no, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> near tigers, but there will be an image that comes up uh, on TV or I'll be walking uh -huh. and I see a billboard that has a tiger on it. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, 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 or somebody will mention a story about a tiger. Uh, yeah. And so that, that comes up a lot uh, for me. Uh, and it, I've recognized it. I mean, it has happened so yes. many times that I know that, it's not a coincidence. And is it comforting? Is that it is, is it very comforting? comforting. Yeah, it's very yeah, yeah. comforting. So there's no yeah, so for me it's a bit of like okay, you know, it it in fact reminds me uh, that I, I'm I'm not regardless of how I'm feeling, even if I'm not feeling my best in that moment, I am mm -hmm. guided, I am protected, I am safe. Uh, and so for me, it's a it's a reassurance. Uh, that I'm not alone in this world. Um, yeah. Which, you know, sometimes when you get in your head, you can make yourself <laughs> believe that you are. But yes. yeah, that is, yes. a, that is a reassurance for me. Yeah. Does it also mean that you feel like you're on the right track? Uh, I would say that happens more with numbers, actually. Ah, uh, cool. So when I, when I, when, you know, 11, 11, which a lot of people use as a, as a sign yes. of like, oh, make a wish. Well, there's a reason why it's make a wish. And that's, that's essentially the universe saying to you, actually, you're on the right track. Uh, or when you have consecutive numbers, so one, two, three, mm -hmm. four, uh, uh -huh. or even one, two, three, that's another yes. sign of you're on the right track. And I, I tend to see them. I mean, a lot of times you think like, oh, you just happened to look at the watch at the time that it was 11, 11. Yeah, no. It, you, time after time. Constantly. After time, Yes. Uh, yeah. Then you realize that, that that you can't always know to look at your watch when it's eleven. No, <laughs> and and it, and it's also not a conscious thing is either, so, is it, yeah, Sunny? It, it's it, not the numbers conscious. Are, are more of an assurance for me than the tiger itself. Ah, um, are there any specific numbers? Like you talked about consecutive one, two, three, four. We talked about eleven, eleven. Are there other numbers that that give you some some um, outside confidence or? or cause you to pay attention in that moment? Uh, so three, three, usually it's repeat, repeat a number. So three, three, yes. three, um, ah. three meaning trinities. A lot of yeah. spiritual thoughts have trinities. Uh, you know, Catholicism does, Hinduism yes. does. Yes. Uh, and so when you have a trinity, uh, it, it's sort of in, in a way saying the gods or the universe are with you. Ah. Uh, when it's, Four consecutive, like four, four, mm -hmm. four. It's the angels are with you. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> when it's Ooh. five, 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 it's usually mm -hmm. change. It's a, it's a oh. sign of, of change and transformation. 
Uh, and for instance, that is a theme in Embolden yeah, uh, yeah. because the, the book is written in five sections and I, I selected oh. the number five um, because for me, uh, Embolden and the poetry in here mm -hmm. was, okay, so now there is a shift in me. There's a shift in the mm -hmm. world. Yes, um, yes. There's a, there's a chance for us to kind of know that there is a change coming and move mm -hmm. forward in that change. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. a lot of times people think that change is not a positive thing, but change is constant. I mean, we, yeah. we are changing, changing all the time. time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I see the 555, I always look at it as a positive thing, because to me, that means that I'm in a process of evolving. Fantastic. And I love that it's the five is in Embolden as well. Mm -hmm. And it's in five, five segments, because that's a that's powerful in terms of your poetry as well isn't it it is because the the, the poetry that is in embolden um i think it was i wasn't conscious of this when i was writing it but looking yeah. back on it and reflecting on it it was very uh in a way emblematic of me mm -hmm. just saying i am a poet and when i said yeah. i am a poet that in it of itself changed yes. me uh, yes. Because I went from a place of this is happening to me and what I'm is get, this? getting poetry <laughs> yeah. to, okay, I am a poet and this is what I do. And that, and that happened in Embolden, didn't it? In that, in that time frame, that's yeah. when it sort of solidified and you went, I, I, I can actually do this. I am a poet. I am creating these verses and, and these poems and it's being channeled to me. Did you think of it as a gift at that time or you just I still acknowledged? Don't, I, still, I still don't. It's really funny because to me it's just it went from being mm -hmm. an experience that I was going through that I sort of had to come to terms with to, oh, this is who I am. <laughs> See, that's just beautiful, Sony. Like, that's really beautiful. That is a true acceptance of what what's happening in your life and where your soul is um, directing you to go and you're going with that. That's a powerful thing because not everyone recognises that soul direction, do they, Sony? That, that there are many, many people out there that yeah. know and whatever it is that holds them back, be it fear or or whatever it is, they're stopped in that point, aren't they? They are. And 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 you know, talking to you, I it just occurred to me, Embolden launched when you and I were at Crom Castle. And I don't know if you know this. Yeah. But yes. You know, every evening when we were at Crumb Castle and we had all these writing retreats and, and, and yes. activities and stuff, we would sit down on the fire and yeah. different different people were reading yeah. poetry, including me. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the first time I ever read poetry in front of a group of people. And I, I don't know, I don't think I actually ever said that, but that was oh the first time I read goodness. poetry in front of a group of people. And to me, that was really transformative. I mean, it, it to me, it just, it was a mm. part of fully accepting that this is who I am yeah. so it's funny just because as we were talking I had that like oh I wait, had the same I'm like I was happening at the same time I know because I was <laughs> actually going to ask you about the wishing stone in Ireland so we've actually had similar thought processes at the same time um and I'd forgotten that in Bolden was launched um mm -hmm. in, in yeah, Ireland awesome. completely yeah. forgotten <laughs> But obviously, Universe was prompting me to talk about Ireland because um, the Wishing Stone, you went and found the Wishing Stone, didn't you, Sony? I did. I, there was a group of us, I think, four or five. I don't remember at this point how many people yeah. there were. And we'd been told more or less there was a Wishing Stone uh, mm. out between, you know, the, the current castle. Two trees. And, and, well, actually, it was, yeah, two trees. But it was, you know, the, the, the direction that we had is, it's between this path <laughs> and where the and old castle path. that burnt down is. And you have to look in between these two trees. And we're sitting there thinking, uh -huh. where is this? We were mm -hmm. also all thinking it was going to be this big stone. Like in my mind, yes. I thought it was going to be big yes. and noticeable. And yeah. here we are, remember, like traipsing through grass. Yes, and yes. This tall, tall grass just to find yeah. this one stone. Uh, yeah. And yeah, 
I, and it was actually in between two trees. It's just we were looking for two trees kind of like yeah. this. And two trees yes. were this way. <laughs> I was just going to say. And my relation to, to that as well was I was walking um, one morning or one afternoon and so was Sony. We were walking in different directions and I said to her, I'm looking for the wishing stone. And she grabbed my hand and said, here it is. And I'm like, oh, wow. And it is. It, <laughs> That's true. I was expecting big, you know, like a big monument. But it's. Kind of small <laughs> and flat. <laughs> so if the grass is overgrown, you're not going to see this wishing stone. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a very beautiful energy around that stone. And um, to sit there and just sit alone in that space was really um, a, a but, you know, it was it was a beautiful energy. Is that how you felt too? Because I know you went and sat there as well, oh, yeah. Sonia. I went and sat a couple of times because I think the first time yeah. around, there were just so many of us. People. After we'd found it, you know, there was like a long line of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think when you and I ran into each yeah. other, I had just gone uh, just yes. to be by myself on it. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, of course, I saw you and was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, where is oh, it, Sonia? <laughs> Uh, I did feel quite a lot of energy. To me, it felt like yes. a very vibrant night. I mean, it was vibrating. I mean, yes. you, you could feel yes. it was warm. It was vibrating. Yes. It felt like, uh, yeah, I mean, just all sorts of crazy things happening. Um, I even had a purple photo appear on my phone that I'd never taken. Oh. I mean, so many things happened with that stone. Yeah, at the yes. time that it was stone, so it was crazy. Yes. <laughs> Just and and it was very interesting, and I agree with Sony. You could feel the ancient, almost like ancient wisdom. I felt around that stone, mm -hmm. and it must have been there for millennia. That stone. We don't know. Yeah, I mean yeah. That, that's the interesting thing that uh, the Earl, you know, had said that his mother would kind of come to the stone and sit mm -hmm. there and he knew that she intended to do that and and, and mm. wished upon it, which mm. I don't know if that's the reason that it's called the, the wishing stone, but he himself said he, he didn't know how long it'd been there. So. Yeah. 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 And the, a lot of the stuff on that land in particular is, is quite old um, and quite ancient. So it could have been there for a very long time. And yeah. who knows what, what happened in and around the stone in ancient times, for instance. I just, yeah. it's fascinating to be uh, <laughs> in Ireland with all of that ancient history surrounding yeah. you and the castle and the castle ruins and um, all the stuff. It's a magical place. Um, Tony, we talked earlier in um, the earlier shows about the flute, the flute story and the flute poem. So, I thought I'd get you to read the flute poem first and then tell us the story around it. Okay. So flutes, if anybody's interested in, uh, it's, a, it's an embolden. Uh, yes. And it's on page 48 in case anybody has a book and wants to read it. Yes. So I'll read it first. Flutes. A woman plays a wooden flute. She has many. In boxwood. Boxwood, cedar, cocobolo, and mopani. She plays twice a day, at least. A unique frequency rolls out of her. She emits healing tunes, wakens the senses with ancient lore. Her melodies take us on journeys, like an eagle soaring through the sky. A deep spiritual perspective, keen eye and a unique vision. Like a turtle that swims in solitary calmness self-sufficient in the vast ocean, carrying its home for its eternal longevity. Sage collected in their travels, the eagle and turtle intersect in the flute, a rare happenstance of shared wisdom. When the woman plays, air, wood, and water combine. A dense canopy in the Catskills, moving zigzag around tree trunks, slow paced with a sense of calm and peace. People wearing thick wool ponchos, looking down on the ruins of a village from the top of the Andean mountains. A gust blowing that flops the hair while standing on a mesa in the Arizona Red Rock. Blue skies above while water trickles down a soft cascade as a river makes its way through Alaska. The ocean reveals a gentle ebb and flow with a light soothing breeze from the keys 
as the sun shines in soft light. Open ears receive the healing without ever having to hear, all because of a woman who plays her soulful melodies where eagles and turtles meet through hand-carved wooden flutes. Oh, thank you, Sony. As you're reading that poem, I'm getting the vision of the place that that uh, flute is being played. It's very powerful. And so the, the, the interesting thing with that poem is that the the first time I mentioned it was in embodying I'm you know was mm. a poem that we read or that I read uh, on the yeah. show uh and and at that point the only thing I had mentioned was uh a line on on, on a poem called sparks that was about a woman playing flutes uh, mm -hmm. and this this woman is a is, is a friend of mine um she and I during COVID uh used to speak every Monday uh mm -hmm. she was on her own at the beginning of COVID I was on yes. my own and she uh, is a music teacher. Um, and so she started playing flutes and she had a collection of different ones. And so sometimes she'd play them for me during our, our calls. Oh. And at one point, uh, I started noticing that there was something different in how the sound changed as she mm -hmm. picked a different fruit, flute. And so mm -hmm. one day in particular, we decided, okay, well, you know, she she said to me, I'm going to send you healing music. And, and she said that she would do this for me even when I wasn't listening. That's why I met a line yeah. in there about, you know, you get the healing even if you don't hear it. Uh, but on this one particular call, uh, she said, just close your eyes and just listen. You don't have to do anything. And she mm -hmm. switched from, uh, I think it was four or five different flutes. And all yes. the things that appeared in this poem are visions that I had while she was playing. So she changed flutes and it was almost like I was being transported, you know, from uh, a, a beach in the Florida Keys to mm -hmm. forests in Alaska to mm -hmm. the mesas in Arizona. It was fascinating. I mean, it was just really, really impactful. Um, and that was how, how this poem came about. Do you know the types of material that the different flutes are made out of? Do you know the history of, of the flutes? Did she talk to you about um, that? Well, I, I included them on here. I don't know which oh, good. which. Like, I, wouldn't, I yes. wouldn't be able to tell you necessarily that, but it was uh, boxwood, cedar, cocobolo, and mopani. That's what she told me. Yes. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell you which was which. You'd have, you'd have ah, to ask. <laughs> but they all had different tones, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. they all and they all played in different frequencies, very different tones. Yeah. Uh, something about you know, I, one the quality of the wood. Uh, I know that mm -hmm. they were all handmade, but also the length of the that was food. my next question. Um, uh, were they all handmade? Yeah, they because all they, handmade. they can actually be uh, carved, or I think the word might be whittled um, out of wood as a complete whole. It's not like yeah. joined together. They're complete. Yeah. Yeah. And so do you? Do you know how old they were, Sony? I don't. I know that some of them she'd collected since she was a child, uh, ah. and others she'd gotten through different sellers. But I don't. Yeah, I don't know. How yeah, old yeah. And has she always played the flute, Sony? Um, she. I know she plays different instruments. Her main instrument is the guitar, uh, and right. that's what she teaches. But in that moment, as we were going through things. She was yeah. being drawn to the, the flute, flute uh, mm -hmm. and she was playing. I mean, she was studying this. Uh, it, it's not something that I know very well, but she was studying how different frequencies have different healing effects on the body. I was just going to uh, bring that bring that mm -hmm. up, and that we we actually know that there's different frequencies that have different impacts on the body. So frequency is, I guess. I liken it to vibration. So it mm -hmm. actually um, works at a cellular level in terms of healing or uh, decreasing um, anxiety, working with depression. There's a whole range of things that those uh, levels of, of music can help with. And it's interesting that at that time she was drawn to the flute at a mm -hmm. time when you were both feeling quite isolated um, over COVID and that the flute was being used in its healing capacity. Well, and the, the thing is when she started playing for me, she wanted mm -hmm. me, the reason that she asked me to close my eyes was she wanted me to tell her if I felt an 
an impact on my yeah. body, if I felt it in different places, what was yes. unexpected was the imagery that came uh, uh -huh. as as we, you know, as she was playing. And so what stayed with me were were uh the visions that I was getting, and that's mm -hmm. how the poem came about. But uh yeah, the, the intention of it for her to play it for me was healing. Oh, amazing, amazing. And we know it's only two that um flutes are again another ancient uh, instrument because they've been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years so there's they're a beautiful instrument and in, when they're played well they are really lovely to listen to like they're they're lyrical aren't they they are and because it almost feels like without having lyrics you're actually mm -hmm. listening to uh, yeah. listening to something like yes. they're actually they're you yes. know, the words associated with it uh so yeah it's it's quite impactful they're, they're quite beautiful thank you thanks for sharing that story with us because um you don't in normal conversation end up talking about flutes or their impact but it's good <laughs> to do that in terms of your poetry because yeah. now you can see the progression of where the poem come from and how it came to be mm -hmm. now I want you to um read me another of your favorite poems from Embolden mm -hmm. and talk us through the writing and and what you were thinking at that time after you've read it to us okay so I'm going to read Dream World, which is uh, on page 170. Yeah. Uh, and so here we go. Dream yeah. World. I have recently had such strange dreams. I can't seem to explain. Distinguishing is hard. What is coming? Is it a sign? Is it a vision? Did I create it? Out of imagination? Or did you send it, led by thy divine? The two mixed together, and I can't tell. What is made up? What is a message? What is a sign? What my brain is processing? What I am guiding? What is guiding me? I don't know what to make of it. Is it something or nothing? I simply let go, trying to control what I see, making sense of it all, trying to decipher. I want to see what will come. I want to know, but maybe I don't. Maybe I shouldn't. Then where is it? The charm is within, in the unknown, the unexpected, the surprise. It can blow your mind, make your heart explore because it is better than what you imagined, better better than what you came to in those strange dreams. Oh, thank you. So talk us <laughs> through that one, Sony. So this one was um, really kind of accepting for me that a lot of what I go through in meditations is very visual, but it's yeah. visual internally, not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you I mean. I don't watch meditations, your... meaning like things come in, yes. in my mind's eye, as they say. Yeah. Uh, and that's how I, you know, like when you were asking me about the tiger, when, mm. I, when I see tigers, I see them in my mind's eye. And a lot of times, you know, it was it was in this phase of trying to understand uh what is it that what what is coming to me am i am i actually directing it or am i not and sort of coming to terms with no i actually do see things in my meditations yeah. and yeah. that is part of in a way how i interpret the world how i connect mm. with the world and how mm. i express things that eventually come out because for instance coming back again to the flutes she's yeah. playing music but i'm seeing images in my head yes um, yes and so it, it it the reason that i chose this one is because it, it kind of helps bring everything together in accepting that i am connected with everything around me and yeah. i'm embracing that connection and making that part of my journey and making that part of my life um, yeah so yeah that's <laughs> That's my favorite poem. <laughs> I think it's lovely to actually see the progression from um the start of the books and to embolden and and see the change uh in the way you talk about each of the books and the progression of you as a human being and embolden is a, the best uh title for this book because you 
you can hear in your story that you're now feeling emboldened to embrace this channeled um, poetry that comes to you and you're feeling more comfortable and you're letting it flow and it's delivering these beautiful um, poems for us to read and embrace ourselves. At the end of Embolden, did you think that that would be the end of it or did you have some sense that it would continue? I wasn't sure, to be honest. I mean, I thought that Mm -hmm. I would continue writing poetry. I didn't Mm -hmm. think or I didn't necessarily know if I had it in me to write more books of poetry. Yeah. Um, I started incorporating poetry a lot more in my other writing. So, for instance... uh, In your novels? Yeah, in the novels. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for uh, like I, I, I would put it up on my website or, mm-hmm. you know, the story that I did for The Colors of Me, which is also yeah. the anthology that your your stories yes. in, yes. a lot of that poetry just flowed naturally as I was writing. Yeah. Writing yeah. It. I think it was three or four poems in there. I don't remember exactly the number. Um, and so I knew it was still going to be a part of my writing journey. I just didn't know in what capacity or in what form. Mm-hmm. But I've surprised myself because I have <laughs> continued writing quite a lot of poetry Uh, And, you know, what I said before, I can go for weeks or days without writing and then in one go, I'll get a whole bunch. Uh, But I am actually working on a new collection of of poetry books. So I know that's so Ah. exciting. (laughs) Do you want to, can you share with the audience, Sony, what's next in terms of poetry and the next series? Have you got an idea? um, The the bigger concept and, you know, we're still working through a lot of the details is journeys Uh, a lot of it because I I mean my own personal journey uh, specifically in the last year or so that I have been searching for uh, a home a place that I want to settle in that's you know so so I have been traveling quite a lot Uh, and some of it is whatever's come uh, through those travels Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of the places that I've been have inspired poetry. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also I have realized that I write a lot more poetry when I am sitting on an airplane or a train. I don't know what it is about sitting in one of those two, but a lot of poetry just tends to flow during that time. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of journeys is the the, the, kind of the name of the the next collection, Uh, but it's going to be a few books uh, of, of poetry. So. And yes. and I remember you talking about the concept that you might make them smaller books. Um, oh yes, because uh, the current series of three are substantially beautiful and bigger books, beautifully uh, illustrated and and written. And mm-hmm. you felt that this time it would be just about the poetry that they would be smaller. The series of books would be smaller and more easily consumed. I guess. Yeah, because the thing is, for instance, Embolden has exactly 100 poems, uh, which yeah. is quite a lot for a poetry yes. book. Uh, yes. And each of the other ones, Embody and Embrace, uh, have 97 and 98. So yeah. not quite 100, yeah. but in the collection, That's a there's lot. already yeah. 300 poems if you if you have all three, uh, which mm. is uh, pretty substantial. And so yes. for the next one, I wanted to be- make them more bite-sized. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, at, at least half of the size in terms of the the quantity of poems in each book, mm-hmm. uh, so that they're a lot, so they're more accessible. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Just because you know, I I like for people to be able to carry these books and sort of just yeah. open to a page and read and whatever read. inspires them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you you'll notice with with my books, there's no table of contents, and and the reason mm. is for that. That sometimes, I mean, you can read it in one sitting. You can you know read it, maybe not necessarily in one sitting, but you know all sort of sequentially. But you can just pick up a and poem intuitively and it. open the book, and that'll be the poem that you get and read. So a yeah. little a little like an oracle oracle card reading, but with poetry that will speak to your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like a, a message for the day, if if, if you if you will. Um, and so they're, they're, they're quite beautiful books for that. They are. Uh, but I want the, the journeys and the new collection that I'm working on to, to just be, uh, you know, poetry. Just yes. Books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now with the success of Lonely Dove comes a little bit of pressure 
for the next novel, but I already know you're working on that. So can you share something around the next novel or three? (laughs) You froze on me, so I didn't necessarily hear the question, but I think you're asking about the next, what I'm working on next in terms of novels. Uh, So I am am currently uh, working on another uh, novel that I have finished the first draft for uh and now i am piecing it together and i think we also yeah. during the show on lonely dub we had this conversation about how yeah. i sort of i don't write the story from start to finish to i just finish. write it and then eventually put it together yeah uh, and so i'm in that process of putting it together mm-hmm. so i have uh a piecemeal kind of story that now yeah. i'm trying to say okay put now that I'm this what is really the story that I want to tell. Um, So there will be another novel coming uh, soon. Uh, After that, I do have other ideas for other novels, but I haven't started working on those yet. Sunny, in talking about that process um, of writing, and it's different for each writer. So some writers um, do have a complete novel planned out in their head from A to B and what it's going to be. But for other writers you write what you're feeling to write about in that moment and you do that multiple times and then you go back and kind of put it into some sort of orders and construct so that it actually is a novel. And um, I'm wondering if it will get to the point where you... Oh, back again. Yes. (laughs) I'm wondering if it will come, um, when you channel the poetry, it comes um, intuitively. And I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if that, now that you've had that experience with the poetry, I'm wondering if other novels will come to you in the same way. It is possible. I mean, you know, the the truth is a lot of times, especially when I'm working on the first draft, Mm. there, there will be a moment when I think of a scene Um, and then I, I sit down and I write the scene and I don't necessarily know where it's going to go in the book other than I'm just writing it. And I'm, I'm in, in the moment writing that, that portion, uh, it's, it's at this stage where I am with this second novel that I'm working on that I start kind of trying to figure out, okay, Mm -hmm. where, where does it make sense for me to include this? Um, you know, is it, is it truly channeled or is it not? I don't necessarily no, it could be because sometimes yeah. I, I just come up with an idea and, it, and I have to get it out. And you put it, yeah. Um, the, the difference, though, is uh, with the novels, I can sit down and say, okay, it's time for me to I'm sit gonna down write. and write a novel. Mm-hmm. And I can just sit down and, and, and write it. And also with poetry, you know, I have it handwritten. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's chicken scratch like that. Like that's <laughs> right there. And on, so um, I think I remember you showing and, me a serviette with, your notes on it whereas with the book I will sit down on my computer like it's on my laptop I will sit down I'll work on it even if I have a thought for uh, a scene I may just jot it down just so that I remember but I when I actually have to write it I will physically sit down on my laptop and writing write it sorry Yeah. yeah fantastic and the audience has to remember that the amount of work that Sony has produced um, including the novel, the poetry, and the next round of poetry books and uh, novels, there's only a short space of time. So this, we're talking about like two to three years, aren't we, Sony? Oh, and I've lost Sony again. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it seems to be in yeah. and out again. It's I was going to say that uh, those storms are starting to um, impact our internet, unfortunately, for the audience. Um, uh, I um, was just wondering about um, you've been so creative over such a short period of time. That must feel wonderful as an author to see the culmination at this point and see the success at this point and know that there are many decades to follow in this <laughs> process. Yeah, but it's it's been a it, it has been a short time, but it's also been a big process for me yeah. in yeah. terms of uh also accepting that as part of my journey uh, mm. in 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 the sense that I want to... 
Oh, and and I didn't mm-hmm. necessarily give myself the permission to do that. I, I followed yep. uh, different career paths and it's almost like mm-hmm. I had to go through that entire process to come to full circle this, and back to say, yes. okay, well, this is actually what I've always wanted to do. Wanted. And I think part of the reason that it's in a way um, happened so naturally is because I accepted it. Uh, mm. And, you know, we talked ab- about uh essentially the the tagline that I have, which is trust in yes, your soul destination. Soul. And that's because that's specifically the journey that I've been on uh, mm-hmm. as a writer. It was, I, you know, the, the universe sending me signs, uh, mm-hmm. my soul kind of leading me into this whole, yeah. you know, writing has been a part of every single job that I've had, yes. uh, whether it's formal uh, or informal, yes. even from something as simple as training manuals, yes. uh, marketing material, website copy, you know, like all sorts mm-hmm. of things that I, I, mm-hmm. I always ended up writing. Yeah. Uh, and it was through that. Um, in fact, in, in the last job that I had as a wellness coach that I started writing wellness related articles mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, once I opened up to doing regular writing and publishing things uh, that I embraced the fact that really what I wanted and what was kind of inside me was a storyteller. Uh, yes, and yes. was that story, it, it was me accepting <laughs> yeah, that yeah. I had a storyteller in me and that I had a, a you know, a, a creative outlet that I needed to, to, to follow. Uh, and my soul had been guiding me all along. I just needed yes. to listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it takes something happening for you to actually stop and listen and go, okay, I think this, this is what's happening. The other thing is that sometimes we have to, grow as a person and become more confident and um, self-accepting to be able to put your work out into the world because it has both a physical, mental and emotional um, toll is not the right word, but it it has an impact on Mm -hmm. you. So you have to be at a certain level of maturity, understanding and acceptance to go forth and put your work out to the world because it's kind of scary, isn't it? It is really scary and it's uh, it feels very vulnerable uh, because, oh, yes. you, you know, you're, you're putting yourself out there, you're putting your words out there. Uh, what what I've always said is for me, the poetry is very personal. It's very reflective mm. of my view of the world, my experiences, uh, how I see the world, uh, mm. whereas the novels are, are, are fictional. And so... Yeah. Sure, I'll draw. I'll draw from experience, but they're still uh, created. But you're a hundred percent right. I, yeah. having lived through everything that I've lived through, mm. I have all of that to draw from. Yes. Uh, in order to uh, yeah. create, I have that to draw from to put together a lot of the stories uh, that I am able to. But I also have the confidence, I think, and the maturity yes. now doing yes. it now than had Definitely. I been you know, twenty years old trying to do this. Yeah, uh, it would have been very different. Yeah, plus I, 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 mean, that... I, I, I fully accept that everything happens the way that it's meant to. Absolutely, uh, and, I, and I know that I was I needed to go through that journey. I needed to go through yes all of the experiences and all of the yeah. background that I have in order to get myself into to... this moment. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and sometimes when life, you're was... walking through those tough periods in life, you just think, "What the heck." And sometimes it's not until afterwards that you go, oh, I understand. Yes. <laughs> that happens in the journey yes. of life. Um, it, it, yes, you and, you know, there's point. a lot of beauty in a lot of the things that I was oh, able yeah. to to experience, and it's really yes. comforting in a way to be able to yes. sit at this point and look yes. back and be able to yes. connect the dots to say, oh, okay, well, that happened, uh, and because that happened, place and because that next thing then I moved on to the next uh, and you know one thing essentially led to another yeah. and there's there's a beauty in all of that so yeah and like steps on a path you mm-hmm. can't take this step you can't jump over that to get to there you've got it one step at a time Sony, we are just about out of time which oh I can't <laughs> believe again <laughs> Before we completely run out of time, I want to give you the last word to the audience about where they can connect with you, where they can buy your books and how they can engage with your beautiful poetry. 
Well, they can find me. The best place is my website. Uh, yes. www.sonysing.com and that's S-O-N-E-E-S-I-N-G-H.com. That has links to everything. My social media, I've got Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, I've got a blog on there. I updated yes. Once a month, there's a newsletter. Uh, there's also links uh, where you can buy the books. I don't sell yes. them myself, but I have links to all yeah. of uh, my publisher site, Amazon, wherever else the books are available. So that is the best place to to Fantastic. You can even send me a message if you'd like. I'd love I was to just going to say, send. <laughs> Sunny loves to hear your messages. She loves to hear how her poetry um, has made you feel. Or if you've got questions about it, Sonny loves, will be open to talking to you about any of her processes. And if you're sitting here listening and going, oh, I could never do that, then talk to Sonny because she's yes. done exactly that. Yeah? <laughs> Sonny Singh. Exactly. Thank you so much. Poetry in Motion, this is our final show. Um, I will have Sony back um, to talk to us from time to time because we're going to want to know what she does next. This is just the start for her. I encourage you to connect with Sony. Jump on, go out, buy her books. They're beautiful. They're great. Uh, Lonely Dove is fantastic and you can <laughs> still, <laughs> still buy it. It's still online. Uh, go to Amazon and you'll find it. And Sony Singh, thank you so much for this series. Thank you. I, it's been an honor to spend all this time with you. So thank you for having me. My privilege, my privilege. And that, my friends, is your lot for this week. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>